It is time to talk about Attack on Titan Season 3 Part 2. So this is covering volumes, uh, the second half of volume 18 through volume 22. I have, my, I have them right here. That's why I was looking over there. Uh, this was a section that was full of some amazing action, some crazy emotions, and a huge giant lore dump. So a lot to talk about. <laughs> Starting with the action. So this part of the story starts off with um, them trying to get to the basement and but first they have to seal back the wall so they have this strategy that they're trying to do uh, in order to, in order to get through but they also know that they are likely going to be ambushed when they get there so Armin cleverly knows that they can hide inside the wall so they are tapping the wall trying to find a hollow point which works Reiner jumps out and attacks. Levi swoops in and near kills Reiner, which leads to giant titan fights, group assaults with thunder spears. Good job, Hanji, for that one. Reiner nearly dies about 20 different times. We have people being barrel tossed, giant explosions that kill nearly everyone, tons and tons of strategy and sacrifices. These scenes were so brilliant to watch. Having the two different teams on either side of the wall, both fighting, both realizing this is a desperate situation, we may not make it out alive, figuring out their last ditch plans and sacrificing so much to see them through. The way they would, the way the show and this, and the series, the manga, would parallel these two different sections going through very different battles and having to face very different obstacles in their battles, yet the highs and lows of their fights were paralleled so well that even though it was split, we were walking in tandem with each fight and it just never stopped moving. The pacing in these episodes was extraordinary and I was on the edge of my seat the entire time. There were several scenes that I thought were incredibly impactful. You probably know which ones I'm going to hone in on. But first I want to mention that in the midst of all this action and in the midst of these incredible battles that are so exciting to watch, there's, we, we have the hype of crazy titan battles and action, but we don't lose any of the emotional gravity of everything that's happening as well. The first one, I think, and the one that really, really struck me and I wasn't expecting was to bring back Marco. Marco was a character that I really, really was invested in in the early stages. I just really loved his character. I thought he was doe-eyed and sweet and passionate and he was just, he was, he was another Connie and I loved his character and I was really I was really sad when we lost him, like his death really affected me. And so to now go back to that memory, but to see it from the, see the part that I missed, seeing, I thought him being off screened, off paged was really impactful. But it turns out that that was just withheld from me so that I could hurt more. Because now as a character that I love, who, was, who not only died in action, but was actually betrayed by other characters that I have loved, betrayed and left screaming out for them and not understanding why. Why are you doing this? Why won't you answer my questions? Like, can we not just talk about this? What did I do? All because he overheard Reiner and Bertolt's conversation and Reiner snapped into warrior mode. He was in soldier mode, but he snapped into warrior mode as soon as he realized that their plan was threatened and he just did what he thought had to be done. And you can see the pain in their expressions as this whole scene goes on. You can see how much this kills them to do this, especially when uh, Annie shows up and she's like, what are you doing? And Marco's calling out for help and they're like, sorry, he hurt us. We take his gear so he can't so he can't get away. And like the anguish in her face is she's like, what? How could you let this happen? Why would you do this? And it's just, you can just see how difficult this is for them. But the greater emphasis is on how unbelievably tragic it is for Marco. Being abruptly betrayed by his friends and left to die and the whole time just crying out to them, just answer me, just explain this to me, what's going on? Help me, I don't wanna die. And as the Titan, 
picks him up and they're out of range, then Reiner snaps back into soldier mode and is sad and is like, why, why is our friend being eaten? Why is this happening? Completely um, detached from the fact that his friend's being eaten because of him. Just the same when they take down Reiner, uh, when they successfully bring him down, this is a triumphant moment for them. I'm talking back now in real time during this active battle that we're currently having. This is a real success for them. They, they're they winning. They're taking down a Titan, an intelligent Titan, which is extremely difficult to do. But it's sad. They're crying and they don't like, it, it, it's a victory and it's one that needs done. I mean, these kids, while they're kids, they have to be stopped. So it's a necessary victory, but that doesn't take away the pain of them having to turn against their friend because their friend turned against them, but the pain of taking down someone that, that they cared about. Bertolt, when um, Armin comes in and, and tries to talk with him, asks for a meeting, even though Bertolt knows Armin's plan, even though he knows this is a distraction, even though he completely can see through everything that's happening when Armin tries to use Annie uh, being tortured as his leverage once again, Bertolt is, he sees through it all. And Armin asks him, why, if you know what's going on, why did you meet with me? And Bertolt remembers that time with Marco. And he says, I, just had to check. Like he, he couldn't relive that, like that he still carries that and he couldn't just relive it again. Someone asking, can we talk about this and not giving them the chance to hear what they had to say. And on the other side of the wall, especially, I mean, all of, all of it, but especially with Levi and Erwin's group, the emphasis on those that were dying, when the boulders are being flung across the wall, when they're being hit, when they're being, when so many people are falling, and then those that remain have to charge into their deaths. The blood, the bodies that are flying everywhere, the despair of the soldiers. Um, I don't remember the one flock, was that his name? The one that carried Erwin uh, back from the battle? Um, when he's like on his knees saying, I knew that I was probably going to die in battle and I thought I could do it. I thought I was fine with that, but I didn't expect it all to feel so meaningless. And then of course the fear in their faces as they charge into battle, knowing this is what we have to do. You know, after Erwin's speech, it was um, something that they had chosen for themselves. They were doing, they did not believe that their life was meaningless or the lives of the people that had fallen before them was meaningless. They were doing this. It was a decision they had made and they were charging forth while crying and screaming and in terror. And even though there's so many incredible moments in this section of hype and excitement, we're not allowed to forget the pain and the loss that comes with this. This is not a glorious war. This is not an exciting war. This is not a victory where we celebrate. It's one where we mourn because of all the people that died and because those that survived don't exactly feel like winners. And in this section, as I said, the two storylines on in, in separate places are very well paralleled. And in one way, that's because uh, both Erwin and Armin are two men who have been driven by their dream. For Erwin, it was to find out the mysteries of the world. For Armin, it was to uh, see the ocean. We have two men that have lived their lives dedicated to this dream and have made the moves that they've made in the pursuit of this dream. And these two men choose to lay their dream aside and sacrifice themselves for the rest. They both choose to surrender their dreams entirely, recognize I'm not, I'm not gonna see the ocean. I'm never gonna know what's in that basement. And then plan to die not seeing their dreams fulfilled. The conversation with Erwin and Levi, uh, where Levi tells him, give up your dreams and die for us. Lead the recruits straight into hell, uh, was such a killer line. <laughs> Maybe could have been delivered softer, but honestly, I think it's exactly what Erwin wanted. He was reckoning with the reality that this is what he's lived his life for. This is what he's, you know, there was that scene where he said that he was standing on a mound of bodies. Like he knows that these people died due to his commands and that the people that have fallen, you know, the imagery of them standing behind him, that's not something that he takes lightly. It's not something that he takes for granted, um, yet he'll do it all 
to get to the mysteries of, of, of the world. And him telling Levi, I have a plan that will work, but I have to leave, I have to leave the charge. I have to surrender my dream and leave it. He needed his friend to tell him, this is the right call. This is what you have to do. And he said it in, I mean, honestly, the line was, the line was killer. I'm not mad about it. But I think it was the way that Erwin needed to hear it. And that's why he smiled when he heard it, because he needed to hear just very bluntly, this is the right call. Surrender your dream and, and do this. And Armin had to do it in a completely different way, telling Aaron, I'm no hero. I'm, I, I have to see the ocean before I die. So I'm going to do this thing, but I'm going to pull back before the end so that I can see the ocean. You're going to have to, you're going to have to do the rest. I'll do as much as I can. And then I'm, I'm going to survive. And you just have to bear the weight of that. And it was a lie. <laughs> um, and it's crazy because Erwin is a character, I'm more attached to Erwin's character than I am to Armin's. And I was also more attached to Erwin's, um, the, the conversation he had with Levi than I was with Armin's. Yet, watching them both, watching Erwin charge forward and fall, and watching Armin hold on while he's being burned to a crisp and just saying, hold on a little bit longer, a little bit longer, and suffering that, I was really affected by Armin's uh, scene. I, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I just felt his a little bit stronger. Not that I should be comparing, because they're both they, they're paralleled for a reason. They both are meant to hold this incredible impact, and they did. But I just, like, Armin's really hurt. Even Erwin's speech, when he was telling these men, when they were all just feeling hopeless and just like, this is it? This is really it? And he said, do you think that all the men that died before you, that their lives were worthless? That, that all of this was pointless for them? It wasn't. It mattered. They matter. You too matter. This is not meaningless. Even his speech just was incredible. There's everything around. <laughs> everything with Erwin was so perfect. And yet Armin's death just shook me. I say death but I mean, you get it. It was a death in the moment. I already kind of mentioned the action, but I just want to give special emphasis to the Levi Beast action because when they all charged into death and then Levi came in from behind, took down all the surrounding Titans and then attacked the Beast, the animation on this was unbelievable. This entire fight scene was incredible. Cutting through his eyes, pulling Zeke out of his Titan form and shoving the sword down his neck, planning to use the serum for the Beast Titan. It was all so perfect. I mean, Levi's already such a cool character, but this scene was unbelievable. Meanwhile, on the other side, Aaron did successfully plug up the wall and then was able to come up from behind and cut through Bertolt and pull him out of his Titan form. So now we have Reiner, who was, who was taken down thanks to Hanji, who is still at that whole scene with the cadets shooting their thunder spears. And then one of them missed. I didn't even notice who missed actually, but one of them missed. And then Mikasa was going to go in and just handle it like Mikasa does, but probably not going to be able to do it. And then Hanji came into the last second and took care of it so that his jaw opened up and Mikasa was able to finish it. That whole scene was awesome too. But anyway, we have an, we have an injured uh, Beast Titan pulled from his form, arms and legs chopped off. We have a uh, the, Reiner in the same condition and Bertolt in the same condition. So we're doing super well. And then all of a sudden, this daggone Titan that goes on all fours comes through, nabs up Zeke, comes over here, nabs up Bertolt, nope, Reiner, and then goes after Bertolt too. But um, Aaron ends up stopping that. Bef but first, Zeke has to say, hey, your dad brainwashed us both. You know, bad news bears. Super duper don't trust him. Um, so, and then, and then leaves. So now we, we're down to one Titan, <laughs> two very injured people. And this puts us at the conundrum of we have Armin here, um, uh, Erwin has been saved by Flot or whatever his name was and put here and we have to make a choice. This scene was incredible because of the tension that was so palpable. Every single character was so on edge, having chosen this is who should survive, right? Like they've made their decision and it was almost exclusively emotional for everyone. I'm more attached to him, so I choose him. Well, I'm more attached to him, so I choose him. And that was perfect because it made both sides screaming at one another, uh, the attributes of the person on the ground. Armin is a strategizer and has been essential for every single battle since he joined up. Erwin is a, a veteran military leader and <laughs> has all of this experience on the ground. And they're just screaming back and forth at each other why their person should be chosen. And in the middle, we have Levi holding on to the serum, 
wanting to choose with his heart as well, and Aaron hovering over <laughs> him so angrily, wanting his to be chosen. This scene was full of nothing but desperation from an entire group of people fighting. And me sitting there, have to, I have to make a decision too because it's how you engage with the story and I'm putting myself in the place of Levi where I only, I like, I gotta make that choice because these they're both dying. So I need to make it fast. And my heart says Armin, like choose the kid, save the kid and in, in, in lieu of the adult. That's just what you do. But my head says, well, humanity's on the line and he's a military commander. So it seems like you should choose Erwin. So, and Plus, I also am putting myself in the place of Levi, so I know that he's personally more attached to Erwin, so probably his his head and his heart are all just leaning towards Erwin. So I choose Erwin too. And when Levi chose er chose Erwin, I, it made perfect sense to me. I'm like, yeah, of course you would. It, it seems like the logical choice. Your gut is gonna tell you to do it too because that's who you've been serving under. That's who you have more of a connection to. Made perfect sense to me. But that hand slapping him away when he rose his, when he was thinking about his time in class and he rose his hand to ask the question about the people outside of the wall, that hand slapping him away made him question for one more second and this time instead of choosing to go with his gut I think he chose to go with what he felt was right for the person that he cared so much about. Kenny had said everyone was a slave to something and Erwin smiled when he was released from his dream that he was a slave to and he thanked him. Erwin's last words to his troops were to put their hope in the next generation. Levi let him do that. By choosing Armin, and choosing the place where Erwin would finally be able to rest. And we get this reveal of his changed decision with Armin coming up over the house with his in his Titan form, and we get to see everyone's reactions. And once again, even though this is a really hype moment to have revealed who is the Titan and that it was a big twist, we're not released from having to also sit with with the pain that comes with every decision. And we're brought right back to desperation. Desperation from Bertolt as this kid is crying out, screaming, help me, paralleling him to what he and the rest of them did to Marco. And the desperate joy from the cadets as they pull Armin out of his Titan form and just cry over their friend that, that didn't have to die. This whole section of the story was just brilliant. Okay, the basement. So, I loved the imagery of them going back to the house and showing them as kids looking at the house after it was destroyed and now as adults looking at the house, uh, returning to that point in their memories as well as in reality just brilliantly done. And then just the quiet of these scenes and um, the stillness of m methodically picking through the basement and trying to find what they need to find, opening up the empty drawer, realizing it's a false bottom, and then pulling out these books that are full of Grisha Yeager's writings, his memories. And this is where we launch into the flashback, and this is where I get overwhelmed. <laughs> So there's very overt World War II imagery here of Nazi Germany, and I don't quite know what to do with it yet. First of all, because I just really wasn't expecting it. Like, I feel I've been tr trying really hard to track with this series and to pay attention to the little things and to, like, piece things together. I fail sometimes, but I'm, like, really trying. But this felt, like, out of nowhere <laughs> to me. But also, I'm not really sure what to do with it at this. Like, I don't know how to process its role in the story just yet. So I have three theories of how this is going to play out. So we have the Eldians who are, or the people of Ymir, who are only Eldians, who are able to turn Titan, okay? So we have this, we have the oppressor and the oppressed groups, and we have within the oppressed group the ability to turn into monsters. These are the options that I think I have to interpret the story up to this point. One, uh, the Eldians or the people of Ymir are a group of mindless killing monsters because of the race that they were born into. This is what it looks like on the surface, though I don't think that that's probably the direction that the story is going in. I don't think that that's, I don't think that's what the hints up to this point are leading me to, and I really hope not. Two, an oppressed group is considered monsters and subhuman by their oppressors, so they become monsters, they become the monsters that they were called, and fight for their freedom. This is what I'm leaning toward. I think that there are enough clues within the narrative up to this point that are that are pointing in that direction that this is a really secure um, interpretation, at least with the amount of information that I have right now. 
or three, there is no commentary here whatsoever, and it's just a lazy storytelling device where a real-world reference is plopped into a story to help us establish oppressed oppressor. There will be no conversation about it, and then we move forward. I really hope it's not this, because I think that that's messy, but I, it would be better than option one. I don't really feel like I can comment on this particular story detail any more than that at this point, just because all I have is the establishing information, um, and I, I, I just feel like I have to see it through all the way to the end to see what the messaging actually is, and then I can comment on it all at the end if I feel like it was executed well, if I agree with what I think the story is saying through it. I'm gonna be honest with you, I am a little bit nervous about it with how it's been presented here at the beginning, but I think that there's enough clues showing that it could be done well. So I'm just, I'm just gonna wait and see. And then after this, it's just, it's just a, it's a lore dump. That's all it is. It's just a lore dump. So I am going to go through my notes. I uh, went through and I, well, I read it all. Well, no, I watched it all. Then I read it, read it all. Then I went back and, re and read the parts that I had marked again to try to compile notes on it to try to make sense of what's happening. Because I'm gonna be honest, this whole section of the story has been unbelievably overwhelming to me. So I have collected data points and tried to connect them and make sense of them. I will fail, like I'm not gonna get this right. But I'm going to tell you what I think I understand up to this point and that's what I can give you right now. <laughs> okay, so we have the Eldians and the Marleans. So Marleans, Marleans, Marleans. So the Eldians are, um, within the Eldians are the people of Ymir. Ymir was the original Titan person, uh, not our Ymir that we already know, but a different one, which is <laughs> greatly confusing. Thanks for that. Um, so the people of Ymir are the ones that are able to transform into one of the nine titans. There's Ymir and then the eight that were formed from her. There are Eldians inside the wall and outside of the wall. We're very familiar with the ones inside of the wall. The ones outside of the wall we've also now gotten relatively familiar with. Previously, the other Ymir, <laughs> the one that currently can turn titan and is currently a part of the story, uh, she was from outside of the wall, which I didn't pick up on before, but I'm, I'm with it now. She was from outside of the wall, as was Grisha, and he was a part of a rebel group whose goal was to take back the founding titan from the king who abandoned them and fled behind the walls. I think what I'm supposed to understand at this point is that Fritz, King Fritz, was the, is the same as the Rice family. So he was outside of the wall. He chose to be a pacifist. He chose peace instead of to fight. And, and so he went behind the walls, changed his name to Rice, and the Rice family line that, we follow, that we've known up to this point is from King Fritz. So like Fritz writes, they're the same. That's what I'm getting at this point. However, the rebel group led by Jaeger and Dina, Dina, Diana, um, they believe that a king who is unwilling to defend his people and will hide away is no king of theirs. So their goal is to go back into the walls take back the the uh, founding titan for them and fight against the Marleans. And the rebel group is led in the shadows by the owl. Uh, Grisha and Dinah, Dinah, Diana, I'm sorry, I've forgotten, married and had Zeke, their first child. Um, when King Fritz uh, left and um, became a pacifist, he left a message letting them know that if, letting the Marleans know, if they attack, then the Titans that are making up the walls uh, will activate and fight them back. So essentially, I'm choosing pacifism. You should choose it too, but if you don't, if you enact war, I'm going to fight back. That's what I'm that's what, I, that's what I understand that message to have meant. So the people of Ymir are very powerful and could take over the world if they want to. So the Marleans, um, who are associated as, in the imagery that's been presented to me so far, they are the oppressors group, okay? So they decided to declare war on King Fritz and take the founding titan, and they will do so by collecting Eldian children, very young children, giving them one of the seven intelligent titan forms that they have control over and turning them into child warriors to fight 
the Eldians behind the walls. Oh, and also they will give their families honorary Mar Marleyan status uh, so that they'll no longer be oppressed. So because of this, Dr. Jaeger turned his son Zeke into a child warrior slash child spy. You're gonna go work for the Marleans and uh, gain intel for us and work for us from the inside, but because he was a child, he ended up adopting the Marleyan ideology and turning on his family. Okay, Reiner, Bertolt, and Annie work for the Mar- is it Marleyans or Marleyans? Whatever. They- you can't respond to me right now, so I guess I'll just- I'll see in the comments. Um, they work for the Marleyans alongside Zeke, and I assume that they too- the- the con- the- the expectation from the context that I have around it is that they too have been raised from adolescence to be child warriors, and their sole purpose is to get back the pro- the- the- uh, the founding titan, get back the founding titan into their control, and, um, you know, kill all the Eldians. So now we understand why uh, Bertolt and Reiner have been saying, we gotta kill ya. Like, we don't have a choice. You you have to die. There is no deal to be made. I just, I need the Aaron, and you gotta die. I now understand why they were saying all those things. Terrible. <laughs> it's horrible. So I think that um, the Bertolt, Reiner, Annie, I think that they were either indoctrinated into thinking that there's no peace as an option um, in the world, unless the Eldians are wiped out, um, or it's also possible that their families were threatened, um, because if you take on this role as being a warrior titan, then, um, their families would be given honorary Marleyan status. So I assume it's possible. I don't know. I'm kind of like reaching. But it's also possible that they could have maybe been like selected for this and it was essentially, you know, do this thing and your family will be prosperous or don't do this thing and, you know, we're going to knock them over the wall and they're going to die just like everyone else that are the people of Ymir. Or I guess I could just say, or they're going to continue to live in the, um, in the, what was the area called? The, the place where the Eldians outside of the wall live. Either way, this, that's my understanding up to this point and me just trying to piece things together. Either way, they don't seem to have much of a choice in the role that they're playing right now, or at least I don't, not, not, not a large one. They were children. So, I mean, I don't know. It doesn't seem like it. Um, so the Marleyan uh, police force or like soldier force uh, were capturing the rebels, uh, the, the people of Ymir, capturing them, turning them titan, and then shoving them over the wall. Now, for whatever reason, they have to keep them away from the ocean. I don't know why, but that was a line that was dropped that I could have easily missed, but it seemed like pointless information. So I think it, I think, I think I'm going to hold on to it and assume that it's relevant somehow. Uh, Dinah is one of those that got turned Titan. And she even told Grisha Jaeger as she was about to be turned Titan and thrown over the wall, don't worry, no matter what, she'll come for Grisha, which is just, oh, so sad. Because, you know, she did when she went through the wall. She did, she found him and she killed his wife and tore apart their family. Not her fault, it's just sad. And then the owl's name is Aaron Kruger. Now, I had a big spiraling theory when I first um, got this information. I was actually, um, I was streaming with my patrons when I watched this episode and I like kind of went off the rails. But I'm also really confident that the theory that I made in the moment was wrong. So I'm just gonna, um, for, I'm just gonna, chuck that in that little monologue into the bonus content, the vlog that's coming out tomorrow um, for you to enjoy if you want that kind of bonus nonsense, but I don't think it was right, so I'm not gonna put it here because I'm trying to just like have my information, in the, the facts I know here. Um, so the owl shows him how to turn Titan, tells him that the shifters have 13 years to live after they, you know, get their Titan form. Um, and his goal is to take the attack titan from the owl, enter the walls, and steal back the founding titan. Um, if someone steals two titan forms, like Grisha did, and then someone steals that, like Aaron then did that to Grisha, um, then Aaron gets both. So he is the attack titan and the founding titan. But also, if someone who holds the power of one of the nine titans dies without anyone inheriting the power, that titan is inherited by a baby belonging to the subjects of Ymir. Um, distance and blood relations are not a factor here. 
Don't know why that matters, but it's information I have and I should keep it. Uh, the subjects of Ymir, I've been saying people of Ymir. The subjects of Ymir are uh, connected by paths. Okay, so paths are invisible to the eyes and the blood and bones of formed titans are sent through these paths. It's weird. Uh, memories also um, are sent along and some outside will. So back to the founding titan, keeping the ideals of, I'm sorry, the people who have the founding titan keep the ideals of the first king. And like, that was a big thing that I went over a lot <laughs> and, and like fixated on. Turns out that that's probably true for all of these nine titan forms. Certainly the freedom titan uh, is, uh, the, the attack titan is all about freedom. No matter what form it shows up in, even if you're born into a sad sack of bones, that person is now a freedom fighter. So that's interesting. All the paths cross at a single coordinate. That's, you know, the founding Titan. Um, paths transcend physical space and time. The manga just said space, the anime said space and time. I really fixated on that when I was watching the anime. And the attack Titan fights for freedom no matter what. I said that. Okay. Um, Ymir, like I said, I now have connected her backstory. She was from outside of the walls. She was grabbed uh, while she was leading these people and she took she took the heat for them. And so now we completed her backstory here where she was thrown over the wall and turned Titan. And that explains the 80 years wandering outside of the walls. I now have put that together before she ate up uh, Reiner and Bertold's friend and became a shifter Titan. Some people were irritated at me for not figuring that out sooner. I, I didn't, so, I, but I get it now. Oh, likely the oath to renounce war by the, um, the first king um, fits who I suppose was, I guess that the reason he's called the first king is because he was the first king who went behind the walls, erased memories, became the first king of the history that is now known of the people behind the walls. Oh, probably. And he's probably also the first rice king. I bet that's it. Okay, right. So likely the oath to renounce the war by the first king was because of the curse that befalls all of the family that take on the ideal of the first king. And by that, I mean like the, the mental toil, the mental toll uh, that it takes on them, which we saw in Frida. Frida? Frida. Oh, also Aaron realizes that the reason that he could use his coordinate ability during that one battle that one time was because he was touching a royal, uh, a royal blood who had turned Titan. His stepmom? <laughs> his late, his, his dad's late wife. I, anyway, he was touching someone with royal blood who turned Titan, but he's going to keep that, that information secret because he doesn't want the military to force Krista to take on a Titan form, um, in case his theory is correct. Uh, this all ended in the owl tapping into some of, some memories from Aaron. Um, again, I'll refer you to the vlog for, uh, my thoughts, uh, speculation on that, but again, I don't think it's correct, so it's not really for here. Okay, last thing, I think I should know who eight of the nine Titans are at this point. I know that Aaron has the Founding Titan and the Attack Titan. Bertolt, now Armin, uh, have the Colossal. Reiner has armor. Annie has female, which, by the way, I object. Like, <laughs> we have all these titan forms. The colossal, armored, attack, the girl one. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> you couldn't come up with one? You couldn't come up with something better than the girl one? Ymir, um, I don't know what her title is. I don't know what her type of titan is. Zeke is the beast titan, and then that cargo titan, the one that nabbed up Zeke and then nabbed up Reiner. The reason we didn't totally win and dominate that amazing sequence, um, I don't know its name, I don't know anything about it, I just know that at some point it was called an intelligent titan, so I'm pretty sure it's one of the eight titan forms, or nine if we're counting both of Aaron's in, anyway. Uh, and then I don't know what the last one is. So I'm pretty sure I should know eight of the t of the nine. Maybe I should know all nine and I'm just not thinking of something. Okay, final, final statement here in this video. Um, I am considering not continuing on with season four the way that I've been doing it up to this point. Up to this point, I've been doing one sit down, you know, reflecting on everything, talking about it all in one video like this, and then one uh, reading vlog where I kind of try to hit point by point what's going on. Um, but while the comments on my videos are overall very protective of me in spoilers, there's still some leading that happens. Like, like I'm trying to engage with the story, 
uh, according to like, okay, so these characters, this is what they've shown me about themselves. So I'm trying to understand and assess and just take it bit by bit. And then I'll have comments that are like, oh, she's falling for this ideology. It doesn't happen a lot, but I, I do get some comments of people who have the full context of the story looking at me as I'm parsing through piece by piece information where I don't have the full context. I'm tossing around the idea of instead of breaking season four into three parts, uh, which I think is how season four is broken up, and doing like moment by moment, beat by beat, instead just just watching it all, reading it all, and then just doing one really huge video at the very end with the final section of the story, just for the sake of not really being led or overly judged uh, on me like parsing through information when I don't have all the information yet. I haven't decided yet. I'm still considering just keeping my normal pattern and like letting it be. I tried just not engaging with comments at all in the beginning for fear of being spoiled, but like that's not fun for me. You know, if I post a video, I want, I want to see what I want. I want to have a conversation <laughs> with the people that are watching it. So I don't know. I'm trying to decide what to do. You can give me feedback on what, uh, what you think is best. Um, but I will either be back soon with part one of part four, or I'll see you in like two months with a really huge video talking about all of part four at once. Um, I haven't decided yet though, so you can give me feedback on that. Anyway, this was a bit of an odd review because it was a lot of just me trying to digest information, at least the second half of the video was. Uh, but to be clear, I loved this section of the story. A couple of things that I'm a little bit nervous about, but I'm willing to see through before really making any sort of assessment on it. Um, but overall, like this story is incredible. I mean, the story is just incredible. So I'm having a great time and I'm very looking forward to season four. So please do chat with me more in the comments and I'll see you again soon. Bye.